filling them with him. <clears throat> Praise you, Lord. Over to you, Matt. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dave. Uh, that was brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody for praying with him. Thank you. Because I am very nervous, but here we go. Right, the Shroud of Turin. Um, I am a complete amateur, so do bear with me. And my wife is also assisting me on the illustrations, and she's a complete amateur too. As a Catholic church-going boy of the 70s and 80s, I was always going to be interested in the Shroud of Turin. My love of history, archaeology and art, together with my religion, led me to watching any programme or reading any article about the Shroud. The Shroud of Turin is a linen cloth 14 feet 6 inches long by 3 feet 9 inches wide. Generally an ivory colour, woven in a Z-twist 3 to 1 herringbone pattern. Um, there is substantial damage to the cloth caused by the known fires of 1532 and 1997 and water damage from the attempts to extinguish the flames. It also has four sets of mysterious burn holes in a pattern indicating some unrecorded trial by fire. These holes appeared in copies of the shroud which were made in 1516. The image that lies on the very surface of the linen is a double image of the front and back of an unclothed, long-haired, bearded man, as if laid out in death. The shroud was first photographed in 1898 by Secondo Pier, and most people identify the shroud with those amazing negative images. But the image on the shroud is actually very faint and pale and seems to disappear the closer you get. The negative photographs produced an amazing result, clearly showing the definitions of a well-built man and highlighting his blood and injuries. The results were so astounding that most people believed the photos to be a fake. And it wasn't until 1931 when the shroud was photographed for the second time by Giuseppe Henry, that the results were accepted. The body image shows an adult male, five foot 10 tall, approximately 12 and a half stone, about 30 to 35 years old. Blood stains exude from the wrists and the feet the flows on the arms that come from the wrists change direction from 55 to 65 degrees, consistent with the crucifixion victim, trying to remove the pain from his wrists and then moving to relieve the pain from his feet. There is also an elliptic wound on the right chest and the blood flow that emanates from this wound has been shown to be mixed with clear fluid. This has been identified as pericardial fluid, which would have accumulated on the right side of the chest from the trauma of the severe whipping. This wound results in a large spillage of blood across the back, on the upper forehead and the back of the head. There are several flows of blood emanating from the scalp consistent with a cap of thorns. The blood flows twist and turn, suggesting a tilting of the head at different times. There is also a striking blood flow just below the hairline on the forehead in the shape of a reverse three. Some of the blood flows show the creasing of the brow, indicating what agony the man was in. There are also a hundred dumbbell shaped marks all over the body.
many on the back, but on other parts from the top of the shoulders to the calves. These are contusions caused by a double pellet whip. There is a chafing on top of these whip wounds, on the back and over the right shoulder, consistent with a heavy object being carried after the whipping. The right cheek is swollen, resulting in a partial closing, closing of the right eye. And there is also a possible fracture of the nasal cartilage. There are other swellings on the left cheek and to the left side of the chin. The history of the shroud is well documented back to the 1350s. Presently owned by the Pope and housed in Turin Cathedral. It was gifted to the Pope by Umberto II of Savoy in 1983. The Savoys bought it in 15, sorry, 1453 and later would become the kings of Italy. They had bought it from the Ducane family who had been displaying the shroud since the 1350s. One of the major barriers to the shroud being authentic was the missing history of the shroud. Where had it been until 1350? How would this relatively poor, noble family come to be the owners of such a wonderful relic? And nowhere was this recorded. This led to many clerics at the time deciding it must have been a fake. The burial cloth of Jesus Christ could not possibly just appear in the 14th century. And if it was genuine, surely it would be owned by the King of France, not the de Charnays. However, the first recorded owner of the shroud does not sound like someone who would perform such a fraud. Geoffrey I de Charnay was a French knight given the ultimate honour of carrying the sacred banner, the Oriflamme, into battle. He died on the battlefield of Poitiers at the hands of the English, whilst holding the sacred banner aloft. He had the highest reputation for chivalry and honour. He even wrote a keynote book on chivalry and left behind poetry that shows his honour and religious piety. A great deal of manuscripts and archaeological research has been done in the last 30 years, which has filled this time gap. The Fourth Crusade of 1203 to 1205 was an attempt by the Latin Christians and the Eastern Byzantines to unite Christianity against the Muslims. The Byzantine Emperor would fund Western warriors to go to the Middle East to push the Islamic hordes back and retake Jerusalem. However, what happened was one of the most shameful episodes in Christian history. The Crusaders decided to go to Constantinople to get an upfront payment, only to find that the Byzantine Emperor, Alexius IV, was, re was reluctant to pay the Crusaders what they wanted. The Crusaders ended up sacking the greatest city in the Christian world and taking most of the holiest rec uh, relics back to Western Europe. During their time in Constantinople, a French so soldier, Robert de Clary, recorded that he had seen in a church My Lady St. Mary of Blachene, a Sidoin in which our Lord had been wrapped which every Friday stood upright so that one could see the figure of our Lord on it. He later added, after the Crusaders sat Constantinople, no one, either Greek or French, ever knew what became of the Sidoin. This cloth 
known as the Holy Mandilion or Mansel, has an historical record that takes it from the time of Jesus to its disappearance in 1204. So if this was the, the Shroud of Turin, this takes the history all the way back to Jesus. Archaeology and ancient manuscripts found in Eastern Orthodox monasteries and libraries have given scholars a great deal of information regarding the cloth, also known as the image of Edessa. Bear in mind that this history is in Byzantium, which is modern day Turkey. This cloth throughout this time was described as not by handmade, which is surely a description that matches the image on the Shroud of Turin. There are artistic copies of the Mandilion, but the copies show Jesus' face only in a landscape fashion. A bit odd, as you would expect the face in portrait, but when you fold the Shroud of Turin along the fold lines it displays, the face of Jesus in this very fashion. The tradition of the Eastern Orthodox Church says that the disciple Thaddeus brought the cloth to Edessa, which is now San Lurfa in Turkey, shortly after Jesus' death. Edessa's King Abgar converted and Edessa became the first Christian city. The earliest surviving history of Christianity was written by Archbishop Eusebius of Caesarea in the fourth century. And in it, he tells us that King Abgar had an incurable disease. So he wrote to Jesus asking for a cure. Jesus apparently replied in writing, stating that he could not come, but would send a disciple. According to Eusebius and other later writings, these letters from Abgar and from Jesus, which were written in Syriac, existed at the time in the public records office in Edessa. The tradition goes that after Jesus' death, Thaddeus brought a vision to Abgar, which cured his illness and converted him to Christianity, and identifies this vision as the Christ likeness imprinted on a cloth known as the image of Edessa. Thaddeus was recorded to be buried at Edessa, and his tomb stands to this day six miles outside the city. The history of the image of Edessa becomes a bit murky after this because the image disappeared. The city had a period where the kings reverted back to paganism and floods and earthquakes struck the city. And during these times, tradition says the image was hid in an alcove within one of the city's gates. The image of Edessa was famously rediscovered in the 6th century, in the year 544. A massive Persian army besieged Edessa, and it was only saved by, the city was only saved by the image that human hands had not made, the one that Christ had sent to Abgar. The story of the image of Edessa, which was written in the 10th century, says that the news of the Persian army's approach sent the people of Edessa into a frantic search for the fabled image, and they found it hidden in the alcove, and the city was saved from the Persians. It can be no coincidence that it was at this time that the image of Jesus changed across the known world. Archaeology, particularly surviving mosaics, tell us that the Roman world believed that Jesus was a clean-shaven, strong-looking Roman. But in the sixth century, the image changed to a long-haired, long-nosed, bearded man. The same kind of image which appeared on the image of Edessa and later the Shroud of Turin. Many images of Jesus from the sixth century onwards 
depicts so many characteristics consistent with the Shroud of Turin. Only four fingers, no thumbs, which tells the, cru the crucifixion nailing causes the thumbs to hide themselves in the palms. Uh, the topless square from the top of the nose, the reverse three blood stain on the forehead. Does this not tell us that the image of Edessa must be the same as the Shroud of Turin? Manuscripts from Georgia also tell us that monks from Edessa traveled to Georgia to paint the likeness of Christ in their churches. It is also from the sixth century onwards that the Im image of Edessa is described as doubled in four. This is the exact folding pattern which would leave Jesus's face at the front of the Shroud of Turin as depicted in many artworks of the image of Edessa. By 679, Edessa was in tolerant Muslim control. But nevertheless, it's, it is recorded by Bishop Arculf of Perigu, who happened to be in Edessa at the time after a shipwreck, that the image of Edessa was subjected to a trial by fire by its Muslim overlord. Could this have resulted in the four sets of mysterious burn holes on the shroud? This is also recorded in a document in Arabic found in Egypt, which refers to the testing. Hail Abgar, who was worthy to behold the image of the Lord, made without ink on cloth, the image of the worker of miracles. It was not effaced when it was tested by fire and water before the great multitude. In the year 943, the Byzantine Empire decided to recover the image for Christianity and sent a massive army of 80,000 to bring the image to Constantinople. Nothing in the Islamic world could stop this resurgent Byzantine army. And when it reached Edessa, it was only a matter of time before the city fell. But to the astonishment of the Caliph, they only wanted one thing, the image of Edessa. They agreed to surrender the image. So the image of Edessa went to the great Christian city of Constantinople and became known as the Mantle or Mandilion and is recorded as the Sindon or burial cloth of Christ. So this takes us up to the sacking of Constantinople in 1204 by the Fourth Crusaders. There is a theory with some evidence that between 1204 and 1314, that the Knights Templar possessed the shroud. A French Templar knight recorded in 1287 that he was taken to a secret place where he was shown a long linen cloth on which was imprinted a figure of a man. There were many reports that the Templars worshipped a mysterious image of a bearded man. The Knight Templars were one organisation that were connected to the Crusades had the wealth to own such a relic and had the power to keep it secret. When Philip the Fair, King of France, denounced the Templars, he tried and then burned at the stake in 1314, the Grand Master of the Order, Jacques de Molay, and his closest companion. His closest companion was called Geoffrey de Charnay of Normandy. There is no absolute proof that Geoffrey de Charnay of Normandy was related to Geoffrey de Charnay I, but the link is probable. The Shroud of Turin has obsessed scientists since the first photographs of 1898. Hundreds of scientific studies 
have been performed on the shroud throughout the 20th century. Frenchman Yves Delage, professor of anatomy at the Sorbonne, delivered a historic lecture in 1902 on the anatomical flawlessness of the wounds revealed by Pierre's photographs. He concluded that the image could not be the work of an artist and pointed out that the body could not have been in the shroud for too long or decomposition would have ruined the image. Although an avowed agnostic, he concluded that the man of the shroud must be the Christ. Delage also noted, and this was confirmed by several anatomical studies since, that the shroud victim was nailed through an area known as desktop space, which is in the wrist. Medieval artists or forgers would surely have painted the nails through the palms. But we now know that this will not hold the body. Throughout the 1970s and early 1980s, scientists were increasingly allowed to study the holy relic. The scientific research that had started in 1973 and then accelerated in 1978 with an American led team, the Shroud of Turin Research Project, or STIRP for short. This team consisted of 40 scientists, Christians, Jews, atheists, and agnostics from all kinds of scientific disciplines. Close examination showed there are no brush strokes. Sticky tape analysis of the shroud surface proved there was no pigment or substance that created the image. They backlit the shroud which showed the delicacy of the image because light went right through it but not the blood stains. X-ray also didn't show the image. A 2011 spectroscopy showed that the image's penetration of the fabric is actually 0.7 micrometers. The blood stains on the shroud passed 11 different diagnostic tests that would allow them to be pronounced as blood in a court of law. Where the blood was on the cloth, there was no image underneath showing that the blood was on the cloth before the image. The colour of the blood showed bilirubin, which is produced when the liver converts haemoglobin after someone is severely beaten or tortured. In certain light conditions, a yellowy blood serum can be seen around the blood. Forensic examination has proven the presence of blood serum which confirms that the man was dead when the image was formed. And Professor Boulogne, head of forensic science in Turin, stated, Forensic examination on the shroud proves beyond reasonable doubt that we are dealing with the dead body of a man that was whipped, wounded on the head by a pointed instrument, and nailed at the extremities before dying. While the injuries were undoubtedly inflicted on a living body, the extensive and complete muscular rigidity, the characteristics of the chest wound that are incompatible with survival, and the blood serum, prove that these are the images of a dead person. In 2018, Professor Fancy of the University of Padua stated that the blood contained high levels of creatinine and ferritin, which is only found in patients who suffer torture. This proves that the only way to fake the Shroud of Turin would be to torture and crucify a real person. The team also performed a spectroscopy which identifies materials from the wavelengths they emit. 
they found soil on the feet, particularly on the heel area. A subsequent study by Dr. Joseph Kolbeck, an optical crystallographer, showed that the soil on the shroud matched exactly the same rare aragonite limestone found in Jerusalem. Also at this time, Max Frey, a Swiss botanist, who used his expertise on pollen for the benefits of Interpol, also took his own sticky tape, sticky tape samples. Frey identified the pollens of different species of plants, some from France and Italy, but others specifically from Turkey and the Middle East. Three quarters of the pollen found on the shroud grow in Palestine. 20 species are abundant in Anatolia and four around Constantinople that are completely lacking in Western Europe. The Shroud of Turin has never been recorded to have gone to these parts of the world. Later studies by Professor Harovitz of Tel Aviv confirmed that pollens from the Shroud match that of Israel, the Negev Desert and the Lebanese Highlands, which match up to the theory of the image of Edessa. Stirp found that the injuries shown on the shroud are wholly compatible with the description of the torture of Jesus of Nazareth as described in the New Testament. Crowning with a cap of thorns was not a normal procedure in Roman punishment. There is no documented description of how the Romans crucified people. Only modern anatomy and archaeological finds have told us how they did it. The spear wound and the whipping wounds are also totally consistent with 20th century archaeological finds of Roman Lancia and Flagrum. In 1976, the shroud was viewed by the U. US Air Force's VP-8 image analyzer. Equipment designed to turn a 2D photograph of a 3D object back into 3D. Invented so NASA could look at planets in three dimensions. The image of the shroud produced a truly three dimensional image proving that the image on the Shroud of Turin was made by a 3D object. Peter Schumacher, the inventor of the VP8, stated, How and why would a medieval artist embed 3D information when no means of viewing this would be available for hundreds of years? Why would the artist only produce one such work? and never pass the technique on to any others. Textile studies show there are no parallels of this weave pattern in medieval times, but there are in Roman times. Also, there were no looms in medieval times of the size to make this cloth. Large looms were used in Roman times to make large seamless tunics. The requirements had disappeared by the Middle Ages. One side of the shroud also has a very unusual seam, which indicates the cloth was even much larger when made. But the kind of tailoring seen on the seam has only been seen once before in materials found in excavations. And that was at Masada, the famous Jewish fort. There is also more cloth allowed for the back rather than the front, which results in a blank area under the rear view and not enough for the feet on the front an error a forger surely would not have made. 
the way the Shroud of Turin has been stored and folded has been recorded since the 1350s. The examination of the cloth showed there are two other separate ways it was folded, but not recorded. One, when it was folded accordion-like and received water damage at the bottom, as if stored in a large jar, just as the Dead Sea Scrolls were st stored. The other, when it would have been folded lengthways and then four times widthways, as both the Mandilion and the image of Edessa has been recorded as being stored. I'm now going to talk about the Sidarium of Avedo, which has great significance for the Shroud of Turin. This cloth has been in Spain since the seventh century. It's a much smaller cloth than the shroud. It's only 34 by 21 inches. It does not have an image, but is covered in bloodstains. The cloth has always been known as the Sidarium of the Lord. The Sidarium has undergone painstaking analysis by 40 scientists over 10 years. The study of the wrinkles on the cloth showed that the cloth was placed over the head and knotted at the top and used to collect the blood around the face. Jews believed at the time of Christ that as far as humanly possible, everything that formed part of the body, including particularly life blood, should be buried with it. So the shroud and the sedarium would be used to ensure none of this blood was lost. Like the shroud, the blood is mixed with water, which is produced by the pulmonary edema that happens to a crucifixion victim. The position of the puncture wounds on the neck are exact. Every blood stain and every wound correspond with the shroud. The blood type is the same, AB, which is common in the Middle East, but rare in Europe. The analysis of the blood determines that the victim was in a vertical position for approximately one hour and then in a horizontal position for another hour. The blood around the thorn wounds is vital blood, which means the man was alive at the time. There are other stains of vital blood, which shows that the man was very bloody before he died. There is a further stain around the nose area, which appears to suggest someone put a fist around the nose in an attempt to stem the blood flow. The scientific studies prove that this blood is post-mortem, consistent with someone who died of asphyxia, as a crucifixion victim would. The face of the man rested on the cloth on one side, and the features of the nose, nasal cavity, chin, mouth, beard and moustache and long hair can be measured and match precisely the victim of the Shroud of Turin. Also with the same swelling of the right middle of the nose. Pollen studies also prove the traditional roots of the cloth from Jerusalem to Alexandria and through North Africa to Spain. 13 of the pollens are from plants that grow in Palestine, not Europe. There are several ancient manuscripts that tell the odyssey of the Sidarium. Early sources say the Sidarium was kept by Peter and he wore it on his head when performing cures and it remained in Jerusalem for 600 years, up to the Persian invasion of 614, which coincides with the date that it arrived in Spain. Arculf of Perigu, once again, he was ship, ship, pardon me, shipwrecked in the area, says he also encountered the Sidarium in Jerusalem after his shipwreck. 
The importance of the sedarium to the Shroud of Turin is the complete 100% consistency between the two. If the Shroud is a medieval fake, how can it match so precisely a cloth that has been locked in a chest in a cathedral in northern Spain since the 7th century? This takes me to the elephant in the room, the carbon dating of 1988, which proved the shroud dated from 1260 to 1390. Professor Edward Hall from Oxford University, who announced this stated triumphantly, triumphantly, someone just got a bit of linen, faked it up and flogged it. And this is probably the last news regarding, regarding the Shroud of Turin that most people are aware of. So the carbon dating proved the Shroud of Turin was a fake. The forger must have been a complete genius. Despite not having the benefit of modern day archeology, span he was able to replicate flagrum and lancia that perfectly matched Roman ones. Crucifixion was banned in 313 by the Emperor Constantine. How would a medieval forger know the correct procedure? Medieval art showed that Jesus was nailed through the palms. How did the forger know this was inaccurate? Would they know that nailing through the wrist made the thumbs disappear? The presence of Billy Rubin proves he would have had to have used the blood of a tortured man. The blood also proves that the man was alive when sustaining the injuries, but dead when wrapped in the shroud. So they must have actually tortured and crucified someone. He also made sure he obtained pollen from Byzantium and Palestine and soil from Jerusalem. And then to get an ancient piece of linen to put the image on using a technique that would never be discovered. He also made the image a true negative with 3D properties. You would imagine a person of such genius would have thought to add some 1300 year carbon to the cloth so he could fill carbon 14 dating whenever it would be invented. No medieval forger would have gone to this amount of trouble when the scientific knowledge to expose the fake would not be available for hundreds of years. There are thousands of examples of easily identifiable fake relics from medieval times. No artwork in human history is comparable to the shroud. There are over 50 copies of the shroud made in the 15th and 16th centuries that survive. All are obviously man-made with outlines, brushstrokes and pigment that are consistent with med medieval artwork. The carbon dating was performed by three teams, Oxford, Zurich and Arizona. Absent were the scientists from Britain's primary carbon dating establishment, Harwell, who were doubted whether the shroud could be accurately dated because of the contamination of carbon from the known fires that the shroud had been in and the water dousing that had followed. Microbiological contamination has also skewed many carbon dating results and some by over a thousand years. In 1994, the University of Texas examined the tiny segments of the shroud under the microscope and confirmed there was a substantial amount of contaminating microbiological coating that was probably caused by the handling of the shroud throughout the centuries. Carbon-14 testing is also not as reliable as many would make out. There are many examples of carbon-14 results producing known erroneous dates. And a Russian scientific team has recently shown that during the manufacture of linen, the waxes and fats from the original flax are lost, giving the remaining fibers a high level of carbon-14 atoms, and therefore making linen seem younger 
than it actually is. A carbon-14 dating of a mummy in Manchester dated the mummy a thousand years older than its linen bandages. Sue Benford is an American housewife who, having watched a Shroud of Turin documentary, identified that the area that the carbon date sample came from was a different weave from the rest of the cloth. She then sponsored x-ray studies, which she said proved the material in that area was different. She used the media to put forward her theory, but Ray Rogers, a famous chemist and research expert from Los Alamos National Laboratory, New Mexico, who had been a member of STIRP in the 70s, vowed to prove that she was an unscientific crank. He re-examined the remainders of the carbon dating samples and found, to his astonishment, that there was cotton weaved into the linen. Chemical analysis also showed that the sample included a mordant gum, which was used to dye the cotton to the same colour as the linen to perform an invisible repair. Fluorescent photographs of the shroud then showed up that corner of the shroud showing up green, proving that the chemical composition of that area was different from the rest. Ray Rogers then issued a peer-reviewed paper stating that the area of the shroud that was used for carbon dating was contaminated with the cotton, which made the carbon dating wrong. His chemical analysis stated the linen was from the time of Christ. The Shroud of Turin has passed hundreds of scientific tests that indicate it is genuine. If a scientist has results of 99 tests that say one thing and one test that says another thing, you doubt the one test, not the 99. Scientific studies of the Shroud and Sidarium continue. High-tech analysis by Italian researchers at Padua University tested some of the fibres taken in 1988 using infrared light and spectroscopy. The results place the Shroud's origin between 300 BC and 400 AD. In 2011, Italy's National Agency for New Technologies published the results of five years of experiments. Every scientific attempt to reproduce the image has failed. They concluded that the ultraviolet light needed to produce the image exceeds even the maximum power available today. It would take an ultraviolet light in the order of several billion watts to burn the image so thinly on a fibre. They also concluded that that light had have to be very brief in order not to set the linen on fire. This ties in with the incredible rumours coming from the restoration of the Holy Sepulchre, which began in 2016. Greek scientists tasked with cleaning Jesus' tomb have experienced a strong, unexplainable electromagnetic field that has messed up and in some cases broken their equipment. If the Shroud of Turin is a 2,000-year-old burial cloth of a crucified man, who is it? The injuries match the descriptions in the New Testament. The Romans usually left their victims on the cross for days. This man wasn't. The legs were normally broken. This one wasn't. Instead, being stabbed in the side by a lance. The victims were normally thrown into mass graves. This one was taken down, 
carefully ensuring that the precious blood was collected. Many crucifixion victims may have been scourged and beaten, but this victim uniquely wore a cap of thorns. I believe that the Shroud of Turin is the burial cloth of Jesus of Nazareth. But this does not prove that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. Our religion is based on faith and the Shroud of Turin cannot prove that Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah. However, when I attend Mass on Good Friday and I survey the cross, I think of the Shroud of Turin. The blood flows that stops at the furrows of the agony ridden brow. The thought of Jesus trying to alternate the pain from his feet and then from his wrists while desperately trying to breathe. The hundred pellet marks, the shaming of the crown of thorns. I then think of the man who, the night before, asked his father if he could let this cup pass and surely must have had the power to do so, but he did not. Then on Easter Sunday, I think of that several billion watt blast of light that happened in that tomb and realize it was something beyond the science of man. There's not, None of you have fallen asleep, have you? Uh, and that's it. Thank you, Matt. Well done. And thank you for all the time and trouble that you've taken in preparing that. That's uh, being...